my talk is a bit about science as a social and cultural product, and science used as an image to sell things, uh, and I looked at American public, but I think that happens all over the world. And science can appeal to a certain part of the audience. It makes you feel that it's credible, it sounds better, it sounds like it's more reliable. So that's what I looked at in my project. And this project was part of a, a master's thesis project that I did for um, the, my master's degree in education. For the, It's called Science in the Public. It's out of uh, SUNY at Buffalo. And it was an all online program. And what I wanted to look at was the popularity of these amateur research and investigation groups because nobody had ever really counted them in, in America before. If you ask how many of these amateur investigation groups, and you'll see what I mean by my next slide, what I mean by amateur research and investigation groups, how many of them are there, what's their popularity, what do they have in common, what may some of them be unique, what is their stated purpose, and if their stated purpose is to be scientific or to undertake a scientific method, are they really doing that? And also, my underlying question is, what does it mean for the public when you're saying you're doing something scientific? So what are these amateur research and investigation groups? Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you have the ghost hunters, the UFO hunters, the cryptozoologists, and the uh, paranormal investigators that are out there. And I call them A-Rigs so I can make a, a cute little acronym that I could use throughout my paper. So the main, the main thing about these groups is they don't operate in conjunction with, with real scientists in, in academia or they're not affiliated with scientific institutions at all. And they end up focusing on not the orthodox body of science but the fringe science, the stuff that the orthodox science won't touch because it's just not interesting to them. And they also use the internet and the media to recruit, to promote, to publicize their work and this group, this, this um, AREG uh, umbrella that I use also does include skeptical groups because many of them do promote that they uh, will do investigations in, into paranormal claims. But not many. Not many make that a main focus of their group. And I would argue that they ought to because then they can compete with how many of these non-skeptical groups are out there. And I, one, one distinction I want to make, this is not the citizen science groups that are run under conjunction with real scientific institutions like Moon Zoo, Galaxy Zoo, uh, Audubon, Berg collecting uh, investigations and stuff like that. These, these are definitely outside the mainstream of the scientific community. So what's the justification for this sort of study? Like I said, nobody had ever counted these groups before and saw what kind of impact they have on the American public and what the public thinks about science. And these popular paranormal shows end up getting millions of viewers a week. That's a considerable part of the American public that's looking at these people and, and maybe believing that they're actually doing something that resembles science. So I thought that that was an important question. And they portray their investigations as uh, professional, um, scientific, and they spurred a ton of these copycat groups that are probably in your neighborhood. And I suspect that many had, didn't have any scientific training uh, for members that are involved, and that, that did turn out to be true. So what's the procedure of undertaking a study? Well, first you have to do a literature review, and then you have to do data collection. So my literature review, this is actually a picture of my bookshelf, and most of my books that I use I already returned, because I'd had so many, I, watched, I ran out of room on the shelf. Uh, I had to do the, the literature review. There was nothing specific to this topic. Nobody had ever really looked at this before, but there was a lot of information about paranormal investigation, and there was a lot of information about paranormal beliefs and in culture. But there was also questions about what is science? What does it mean to do science? What is pseudoscience? What is the history of an amateur contribution to science? Because amateurs have been important in contributing to our body of knowledge. What it, does it mean to be on the fringe of the sciences? What does it mean to um, have internet communities available to organize and, and bring more people into your group? And one really important thing that I found is what does it mean to uh, have an, a leisure activity that helps define who you are? Um, maybe you're not so happy with your job. Maybe you're a plumber for Roto-Rooter and you feel like you want to go out <laughs> and do something more valuable for society. You feel like you, you have some calling and you want to do something good for people. And that ends up becoming your leisure activity that helps define who you are as a person. Data collection. 
I ended up uh, looking for websites. That, that was my goal, is to use the website as a way to see what these groups were promoting and what their purpose and goals were. And I wanted to collect all the websites I could for all the individual groups. When I got to about 1,500, I realized I was not going to get them all. So I started to scale that back, and I decided that I'd use a nice round 1,000 websites to investigate. And I've gotten through all 1,000 websites and cataloged the data on them. And that's what I'll be presenting the results of today. So the results are, yeah, a really, really huge uh, ghost community. They, they, they will say that that is their main purpose. They focus on ghosts. 879 out of the 1,000 groups said that they focused on ghosts and investigating hauntings. There's additional 81 that would call themselves paranormal investigators, which encompassed all of the categories, including ghosts. So you can sort of count that in with the ghosts. Cryptozoology was about 35, and UFOs and combinations of either crypto and, and ghosts were an additional five. And I just want to make a point out of this. This is group categories. I'm counting groups, groups as the, the, the data analysis, uh, not individuals. So even though ghost hunters show up as 879, which is probably a huge number of people because some of the ghost societies are, have thousands of members, you also have the UFO group. Uh, MUFON is, is included in there, the Mutual UFO Network, which also includes probably several thousand people across the country that are volunteers for that group. So even though I'm only counting one under UFOs, UFOs have sort of coalesced into like one, probably about four main groups where the investigators are out there, but yet they're all over the country. It represents actually quite a number of people. So the results when it comes to science. So I looked at the websites and I looked specifically for the word science or scientific for the groups defining themselves as, as using science as part of their methods, mission, goals, or purpose. And 526 out of 1,000 specifically used that word to describe themselves. An additional 27 used it in terms of their equipment. We use scientific equipment. An additional 20 came out and said we're quasi-scientific, semi-scientific, or that it was strongly suggested that they use science. They would say things like, well, this isn't an exact science. That suggests that it's sort of a science. Or they would refer to scientific uh, papers, and they love to refer to Einstein and uh, Edison <laughs> and quantum and things like that as well. But that constitutes 57.3% of these groups affiliating themselves with some sort of scientific uh, value. 19 were definitely no, they were all spiritual or religious, they had no, no interest in, in using science or scientific equipment at all. But 408, they didn't state. So they, they could fall into any of those categories there. It's just sort of an unknown. I, wrote, I don't really know, but I bet if I asked them, they might say that they do attempt to be scientific. But I, I it didn't have time to really get that deep into it. But So you're looking at well over half that are definitely considering themselves uh, scientific. So they're all across the United States. I found one in every uh, state and D.C. The, the number one, and I, like I said, I didn't get them all, but the number one state that had the most was Ohio with 82, and Pennsylvania was next with 81. And believe me, some of these groups overlap states, so they must be just running all over each other in these two states. They're not that, they're not that big. But there's, there's a huge number of these groups all over the place, mostly on the East Coast. There's, they're, they're much heavier on the East Coast than they are uh, in, in the center part of the, the country. But the next number was Texas with 49, and that's a fairly big state. But they really must be, the, the point of this was they really must be tripping over each other. And if there's about 2,000 of these coming and going in the United States at all times, that's a lot of people participating in this activity. And I just want to make a note. I didn't even go to Facebook to look for data on these groups. So there are hundreds of groups that are on Facebook that I didn't even account for. So a little bit about their evidence and reports and documentation on their sites. Number one thing they like to put up is, if they're ghost hunters, EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. They're just, these little wave and MP3 files are all over the site, and I listen to some of them, and they're, they're just extremely poor quality, as you can imagine. Uh, they all have photographs, they all have videos. Um, it's not very convincing. The Bigfoot sighting people sometimes show me pictures of broken saplings or trampled, trampled grass, and they'll, they'll have sound vocalizations and pictures of footprints. The UFO people don't have anything to take a picture of usually, and there's, it's usually all eyewitness accounts. There's no physical traces left. 
So the quality of evidence is really poor, and it's not really trustworthy because I have to, if I'm looking at their site, I have to wonder, um, that EVP, are you sure that there was no other noises going on at the time? Are you sure the place was locked down and there was nobody else inside? No, I don't know that. I have to take their word for it, and, and I don't really trust that at all. So what good is this evidence up on their site? It's, it's no good. It's, it's pretty much valueless. And their reports and their documentations, they, they often will put these reports on their websites, and it will be, uh, as, as you can imagine, does not resemble at all what you would get out of a scientific field or lab report. doesn't look at all like that. You're hard-pressed to find anything like a graph or a table or a readout of the instrumentation, uh, never a map, which is a basic thing that you would put if you're doing a field investigation. And it's filled with subjective observations. I felt this, so-and-so heard that, um, we smelled this, it got cold, things like that. Nothing that somebody else could check, and it's obvious that you couldn't go back and reproduce this study if you tried. So it's not nearly detailed enough to be useful at all. So some of the observations that I found were, and, and I don't want to, I guess with these groups, they seem like an easy target, that, that it's easy to poke holes in, in what they're doing. And one thing that I found is that they actually do attempt to use sound strategies. They will, out, they will go out and they will do library research about the site, historical research, and they will put in hours of effort over, overnight to record all this data, video, sound, and then they'll go back and spend a whole lot of time editing it and look for uh, the information that they're trying to extract from it. So it's not that they, they're, they're lazy. They put in a really big effort. But again, what they're getting out is, is not necessarily what they think they're getting out. They have huge goals. Some of the goals that they, they will state on their website is they want to prove life after death. They want incontrovertible evidence of ghosts and uh, any mysterious animals out in the woods. They want to convince the scientific community to recognize them. They never mention that science is uncertain or that they're uncertain. They are really convinced. So when they use the term science, that they're doing science or they're gathering this information, they're absolutely convinced that it is valid. And they, they, want, their, they want recognition from the scientific community. They make interesting allusions to skepticism in two ways. One, they'll say they like skeptics on their team because the skeptics will point out the natural uh, explanations. That to me is right a, pr a problem right there because if you have to have somebody in particular to come on your staff and look for natural uh, explanations, you're probably really biased. The second thing about skepticism that you'll see very, very often is they'll say, I was very skeptical until the evidence uh, convinced me otherwise. So they use skepticism to set the bar to look apparently high, that their evidence is so good that it overcame their skepticism. You know, it's, it's used a little bit loosely in that context. They don't really use the word theory in the correct way, obviously. <laughs> they have a lot of theories, and they're completely implausible scientifically. They don't make any sense, and they're not based on existing information, which is how science works. You start with a basis of information that everybody else has done, and you build upon that, and that's how the knowledge progresses. They, they don't really do that. They leave fundamental questions unaddressed, and the big question they leave unaddressed is when they go to a site and they, they take information from the person who said something strange went on, they never ask, well, did it really go, go on that way? Is that what really happened? Is there something mysterious here? They have leapt over that, that initial question and have gone into looking for data to support the idea that they have. And obviously, they're all biased. Um, and I, I guess I shouldn't say they're all biased, but the bias is just rampant. You, you, they, they are believers. They will state that they are believers in this phenomenon that they're investigating. And right when you do that, you've just totally blown your credibility as a scientist because you can't, you can't control for those observations that, that are going to feed into your existing bias. And the big, the big thing that I did see was they really want to help people. They want to help people deal with an experience that they have had that is scary or confusing or disturbing and that is giving them a problem in their lives. And these groups will make a huge effort to make people feel better. And they will also say that they're interested in, and they, they do a lot of good work when it comes to historic preservation of sites. 
and raising money, and they will also uh, make an effort to keep cemeteries uh, secure and restore gravestones and things like that. So they do a lot of good, and so you can't really bash them for that. They are trying, and they think they are doing something good and making an effort.